Leslie Drynan first came to the LMB as a research assistant in 1995 and worked with Terry Rabbits until his departure in 2007. She moved into Andrew McKenzie's group for the next five years and during this time became steadily more involved with the workings of the LMB Biological Services Group, the BSG, which looks after the LMB's mouse and rat colonies, both at the lab itself and at Ares, the purpose-built off-site facility. After two years as the BSG's principal scientist, liaising between the BSG and LMB researchers, she took over as head of the BSG in 2014 and has led the facility ever since. Welcome, Leslie, Thank and you. thanks very much for agreeing to talk to us. So I'd like to start by asking how you came to the LMB. OK, so I, I went to Glasgow University and I did a couple of degrees in biochemistry, left there and went to work at um, a research institute, which was actually in my hometown of Ayr. And I worked with animals there, with rats and sheep, um, looking at an enzyme and fatty acid oxidation with relevance to diabetes and pregnancy toxemia. Mm -hmm. So I had worked with animals and it was there that I sort of learned how well they were cared for and that their um, welfare was, you know, that, that's really important to robust scientific results and reproducibility. Um, and then two years came, it came to an end, my contract finished. And I'd been down to Cambridge a couple of times with work and I saw an advert in The New Scientist um, from Terry Rabbits uh, inviting applicants for a research, research assistant post to work in his lab mm -hmm. um, looking at mouse models and cancer biology. So I uh, applied, I got an interview, uh, I nearly didn't make it. The first time I tried to get down the train got stuck at York and I had a frantic conversation with Terry and he said to me, you're not going to like what I'm going to say and I thought he was going to tell me not to bother but no, he said, come back down on Monday and I'll interview you. So I came down for the interview, met with him. Um, he actually did most of the talking uh, and some of the things that he spoke about we didn't do uh, until the next 10 years. So he was very well organised and he knew what he wanted to do. Mm. Um, and at the end of the interview, he took me upstairs to the LMB canteen and uh, uh, he, he bought coffee and he had a scone, but I didn't. And when... This, so we, we this is, this is an not, example. This, we should say this is not the scone that he <laughs> No. <in>. <laughs> this <laughs> is an example of the yeah. world famous LMB cheese scones. Yeah. So Terry had a scone and he sat down and he took one bite of it and it just exploded into a million pieces. And Terry never missed a beat, just carried on picking up bits of the scone and eating it and talking away to me. So that was my first encounter with the world famous scones. Yeah. Yes, and I guess they've been a staple of the canteen for probably yeah. almost since it started. Yeah, yeah. And an extremely good hangover cure, although I, I wouldn't know anything about that, <laughs> no, of course. Neither. No, no. So, so what were your first impressions of coming into that? You were in the old building. Yeah, so I, so I was in the old building, and I have to admit that I actually didn't know anything about the LMB when I applied for the job. Mm. It wasn't until I got here that I realised, you know, how amazing the place was and you know there were Nobel Prize winners walking down the corridor. Mm -hmm. um, when My actual impression of the labs were that they were quite messy and they were quite small and different from what I was used to but once you know you join the group um, you make lots of friends everyone was really enthusiastic about the science you could get help anywhere it was just a really good place to work. Mm -hmm. So you, you, it was you and two other technician yeah, research yeah. So assistants. Terry was very lucky and had a team of three technicians yeah. working from him. I Does don't know, I, I don't know how he managed to do that, but we essentially did Terry's work. Mm. Um, and at the time, Terry was working on chromosomal translocations, and uh, you know you would get a bit of one chromosome that would fall off and join onto another one, and you would get these different fusion. Pre uh, proteins and they could be oncogenic and cause cancer so he was making a lot of mouse models um, and I can't say that I can that I understand everything that he was doing but it was very clever genetic engineering of these mouse models so Terry would know what he wanted to make he would design the constructs and then Alan Foster he would make them and then Richard Panel and I would do the micro injection 
of the either the transgenes or the um, genetically modified ES cells mm -hmm. into embryos, and which were then put back into mice, and then we would either get chimeras or transgenic founders. So had you done microinjection before then? No, I'd never done anything like that before. At university, I did physiology for a year and I really enjoyed histology. So I, I liked microscopes, but I'd never done anything like that. So it took about three months to learn. And I was taught by Isabel Lavenier, who, who still works in the LMB. Um, she worked for Terry for a few years at the start when I was there. Um, it's, it's quite addictive. Uh, obviously, you've got um, a mouse egg. The part that I was doing was pronuclear microinjection into a one cell zygote from a mouse. Um, and you'd set it up, you'd have the microscope, you'd have your little slide, and you'd have a little sort of column of media inside with the eggs, and that was surrounded in oil. And then you'd have manipulators on the side of the microscope. One would control like a holding pipette, which you used um, like a vacuum to suck the eggs onto to hold them steady. And then you'd have a, another micro manipulator, which was... Um, which had the needle attached, and the needle had a solution of DNA, um, the transgenic, uh, sort of the transgene under the control of a promoter. And you would work, you would sit looking down the microscope, and you would, you know, pull an egg onto the holding pipette, and then you would inject, and then you would gently move it to the side, and then you would do it. And it was actually it was very calming once you'd learned how to do it, and I, I really enjoyed doing that. And of course, the exciting thing was that when you got mouse pups born, you would analyse them, and you could get a a founder mouse, which was one that had the genetic material incorporated, incorporated into the genome, and you would analyse them by gel, and you'd see a band, and this was really exciting because you'd made an, a novel mouse, mm -hmm. and obviously um, these mice were very useful, and we sent them all over the world to different labs so that they could work on them as well. Mm. So, I mean, it can't be easy doing micro injection. Did you have particularly green fingers? Do you think? Um, I, it's very difficult at first because you have to make everything yourself at that time. I don't know what it's like now, but you had to pull uh, the needle yourself on a pipette puller. So this is a glass, yeah, a glass pipette that you had to pull out, pull out and to make it very sharp, and then you'd knock the end off, and that would be the solution. And then with the holding pipette, you'd have to sort of pull it on a little Bunsen burner, pull it like that you break it and then you'd have to round off the edges in a forge. So mm. that's why it took me a little while to get used to it. But once you get used to it, it's all sort of muscle memory. You could sit and you'd look down and you wouldn't even look at where your hands were going. You'd just be, you know, like this and everything mm. like that. So. Yeah. Was it especially important to you that it was, you know, eggs and life and things rather than just cells? Um, <laughs> to be honest, it... Be, you, you keep in mind that it's um, it's a mouse, that that's a little embryo that could, that could grow into a mouse. So you have to be you have to treat everything with respect, mm -hmm. and you have to put your best efforts into making everything work. So because a mouse has sacrificed its life to donate these um, embryos, and you want to get the best and get the best scientific results mm -hmm. out of it. So you always keep in mind that you couldn't think, oh, I'd, uh, I've had enough today, I want to stop. You wouldn't stop, you would just keep going because everything was important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly the right attitude you need, I yeah. guess, if you work on, if yeah. you work with animals. Yeah. It's important, isn't it? Yeah. So so I think you had some bird-related incidents <laughs> while you worked with Terry, is that right? So Terry was very, very organised and every Monday uh, the three technicians would have a meeting each with Terry. You sound like the three musketeers actually. Well, actually that's what Terry called us. Really? He called us the three musketeers. Um, I, it was quite funny because after Terry had left he came back to give a talk and he put a slide up during his talk and I was sitting in the audience and it was a photograph of uh, the 313 Dream Team or the Mouseketeers and it was a picture of Alan, Richard and I at a Christmas um, do at one of the colleges from 1995 so we're all much younger and, and that it, it was obvious that he was really proud of us and that we'd you know, given a good service and, and that he missed us after leaving us here. Yeah, so, yeah, that was really good. So do you think this is a good place to be a technician? Uh, yes, I think I think it is because you've got the option to... You can dip in and out of the science um, and you can find out lots about what everybody's doing. There's obviously there's talks you can go to and with... Um, 
the micro-injection. In later years, when I worked for Andrew McKenzie, I ran a micro-injection service for the whole lab. Mm. So you would go and you would speak to group leaders or researchers, PhD students, about their work, what they wanted to achieve. You'd advise them on the best way to do it. And they'd tell you a little bit about their work. So you knew everything that was going on. Um, Yeah, it's really good. So if you wanted to be involved and curious about what was going on, you You could could be. be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. And then Terry left after you'd been with him 12 years? Yeah, 12 yeah. years, yeah. yeah when I, I didn't answer your other question properly. Um, oh, no. I remember I when, um, yeah, <laughs> when he used to go for a meeting on a Monday morning, um, Terry would have a list. You'd have a list of things that you had to do, and things would move up the list depending on the priority. And something would start as A, there would be B and C. But if things were getting, you know, really... Um, exciting in the lab, things would go to A star, A star star, A star star star, and that meant that there was a paper somewhere and you had to do this quickly. Um, But one of the things that Richard and I found distracting in Terry's office was it it sort of looked out over the, the front of out of the lecture theatre and house martins nested on the building and at certain times of the year when the house martins had fledged they were flying all over the place and Richard and I were keen bird watchers and very keen on Mm. animals in general and we tended to get distracted now Richard was worse than me but I do remember that at one point a house martin flew into the office and sort of landed on my summary and Terry again not very easily distracted, just picked it up, threw it out the window, it flew off and then carried on without anything. And I was sitting there like a goldfish going... (laughs) (laughs) So his style, I guess, was rather different from Andrew McKenzie's then. Yeah, so it's funny, they're quite similar in that they're both very tall men, quite intimidating until you get to know them. Um, uh, Andy... I suppose because Andy's about the same age as I and we were friends before I went to work for him. Um, Maybe I kind of felt differently about working from him, but he wasn't into the summaries or controlling or checking up on what you had to do. He just told you what he wanted Mm. you to achieve and you went away and you did it. So in a way, it sort of taught more self-reliance because if I had an issue, I would solve it myself. And that's where the LMB is a good place to work because if you go into any of the labs and people do a certain technique or they know about something you don't know, they're, they're quite happy to help you. Mm. Um, and I think I grew in confidence yeah. working uh, in Andy's lab. And also during you know big projects that we had on, he always tried to get the best out of an experiment so the whole group would work on it and you could start at um, six o'clock in the morning and you'd still be there at two o'clock doing the facts um, at night and I find that because I was younger I I couldn't do it now (laughs) but when I was younger it was really exciting everyone working together um, and we'd go over to McDonald's or Burger King and Mm. eat and things like that together it was really sociable. Yeah, yeah. I think this is a nice place to be if, you, yeah. if you're not particularly attached anywhere else. There is a social yeah. life here, isn't there? Yeah, that is good. Yeah. Did you ever test out the Adam Brooks staff canteen? I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we won't go there. <laughs> Literally, we won't go there. So when, while you were working with Andrew then, you, that was when you started moving much, much more closely towards the BSG. Well, so. I, I think... Working for Terry, I managed his mouse colonies and the genotyping and arranging experiments. So I was always sort of a a liaison between the animal facility and the labs. Mm -hmm. Um, And then with making the transgenics, I worked in the animal facility and, you know, uh, was mixing with the animal technicians and I knew them quite well. But then when, um, you know, things just developed, I was doing more and more animal work and they were looking for a scientist to be involved in the BSG management team, just to sort of bring it closer together towards the lab. With the animal facility being remote, there was some distance between us. And Mm. it's not that people speak a different language, but they've got different pressures. So obviously the animal facility is concentrating on the welfare, looking after the animals, setting up the breeding, um, running some of the experiments. Whereas across here, there'll be um, 
Obviously, the scientists care about the animals as well, but sometimes, you know, they would have pressures. They're only here for three years and they've got to complete their PhD and they've got to do this. So say if something happened and they didn't, we didn't have the mice that they needed or um, something didn't work properly, they, we couldn't get a blood sample that they needed. It was to explain, you know, each other's pressures and why people were reacting like that mm -hmm. and just basically to facilitate the science. Yeah, it's really helpful to have someone who knows both sides yeah. of, the, yeah. of the fence, so to speak, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And so how big is the BSG? So uh, the BSG has over 70 staff. Wow. Um, the majority of them are trained and competent animal technicians. So I'd say we've got over 50. Yeah. And the rest are, um, we've got admin, we've got training people who are responsible for training and competency because you can't do anything to an animal unless you're trained and competent and licensed to do it as well mm. from the Home Office. Um, we've got admin staff, we've got um, the service staff, um, Matt Coleman, he's, he's essential, he's the guy who procures everything for us and keeps um, all the equipment running and he liaises with the states and facilities because obviously it's a separate building to this so there's a lot of work to do there. Um, yeah. Was it was it a big decision for you to make that that to jump the fence entirely, so to speak? Um, uh, I think I missed bench work. Mm. Um, I think I'm interested in a lot of things, and I was never particularly wanted to concentrate on one thing. You know, my mind sort of flits about all over the place. I like to know everything, a little bit of everything, and not much about anything. Um, I'm. I missed the bench work. I missed, you know, sort of the physical action of pipetting and the excitement of doing an experiment with your colleagues mm. and then getting the results and stuff like that. But actually, looking after staff and a facility presents its own sort of problems. So you can use the way you were trained scientifically to, to resolve issues and resolve problems. And actually, I really like people. So rather being in here at two o'clock, potentially on your own, you know, you've always got people around you, people coming to you asking for advice. And I really like when the scientists come and they're like, I want to do this piece of work. What do I have to do to get this? And you advise them that they need their home office license. All the work needs to be ethically approved by AWERB and the home office. And say, you need this mouse strain, so we'll need to import this in. Um, yeah, it, it's just really good to help people. Mm. How, how have things changed in the time since you've been working with animals then? So obviously, uh, the LMB and the MRC has signed up to the Concordat on openness. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was about 2012 when we probably joined and then maybe launched in 2014. So that means we want to be open about um, how we use mice, where we use them and why we use them. Um, and you want to make the public more aware of animal research. Um, I think previously when I first started you wouldn't say a word, you wouldn't say anything about it because the animal rights people were very big and they were quite active and and it was it was almost dangerous. I remember in my first lab they would check underneath the cars with mirrors and things to see if there'd been any devices uh, planted. Uh, but now obviously we want to be more open and there isn't there isn't anything to be ashamed about. All of the staff um, who work in the BSG, the welfare of the mice is paramount. Um, we do lots of things to ensure that they're happy and healthy. As I, I might have mentioned before, you really need to have a healthy mouse or else you won't be able to get robust reproducible results. Um, you know, they've got, they're in a, a cage, an IVC cage, it's individually ventilated, there's clean air going through, they've got bedding, they've got nestlets, they've got enrichment um, toys. Uh, yeah, they're very well looked after. And the majority of the mice that we keep are for breeding, for doing genetic experiments with breeding. So 75% um, of what we do is, is classed as sub-threshold, um, very minor interference. So they're just existing wrong. Yeah, they're just existing. Uh, breeding yeah. and, and, well, I suppose breeding is kind of a procedure yeah, yeah. and giving birth to transgenic mice um, and mouse models of diseases. Sure. So. Yeah. 
So I, I read something on the website about non-aversive mouse handling that's been Oh, introduced. yes. So that was a thing. Um, normally, you know, when I was trained, when you pick up a mouse, you pick it up by the tail and then you put it on your hand. But um, there was some work done by a group in Liverpool on non-tail handling methods. So instead of picking the mouse up by the tail, you would either you would cup it or you would pick it up in a tube and they, they proved, well, they showed that um, the mice didn't get so stressed. Mm. So we wanted to change over, but it's quite a big thing to make a change like this, especially quite a lot of people have been doing this for years and they might not have seen, you know, I've always done this, it doesn't hurt the mice. But it doesn't do any harm to the mice. Um, the way that we introduced it was we had a very talented supervisor, Rachel, who was very keen to do this. So she trialled the non-adversive handling in her room and she had some aggressive strains where the technicians would get bitten and she found that these strains were much calmer so they were obviously less stressed and then Rachel um, sort of spoke to other areas of the facility about issues that they perhaps had raised and they thought oh, it's going to take a lot longer to do everything but Rachel proved that it didn't once you got used to it and the mice seemed happier and less stressed. Um, we moved it around the animal facility and uh, each room adopted this as a practice. So it probably took about a year mm. to change over, but it was well worth it. Yeah, yeah. Are there other things like that you're particularly proud of? Um, <laughs> well, this work isn't published and, and it's going to be published once I get around to writing it, but obviously the pandemic got in the way. But mice, um, if... if a mouse is going to die from natural causes, it's probably when it's really young. Mm -hmm. And we record a thing called pre-weaning mortality rate. So we've got wild type strains that we breed and maybe they'd lose a couple of pups per litter. And then this isn't good. So we wanted to do something about it. We looked at a couple of methods to see if we could reduce the pup deaths. And we used a wheel, a running wheel, to see if this would take the mother's mind off the stress of having babies. Um, <laughs> you probably shouldn't say babies, mouse pups. Um, and we used a little red house. So the little red houses had, had a door, um, you know, a few doors to go in and out. And mice can't see red. So when they're in there, they're, they feel, a th well, I think, we're assuming they feel very protected and safe. Um, and we tested it out on a strain C57 Black 6 jacks, which are known to have a higher pre-weaning mortality rate. And we um, set up breeders with the little red house. We set some up with the wheel and obviously we had some that were normal, that, that were just the normal toys. And we, um, you know, we recorded how many pups were born and it took a... It took about two years to get this data and then the pandemic happened, so we had to stop. Mm -hmm. um, but we managed to reduce the pre-weaning mortality rate in the C57 black six mice from about 36% mortality to 18%. Mm -hmm. So we halved it. And this is really good. This is a really good thing to do. It's um, uh, a three hours refinement. So yeah, um, mm -hmm. yeah. hopefully we'll get it written up and published yeah. soon. Yeah. So what is it drives you day to day running the mouse house? Um, I think f me personally, it's facilitating the science mm. and making sure that we care for the animals, and making sure that the staff are trained and competent, um, that everybody who requests our services, that we provide the best service possible. Uh, yeah, I can get really into work. Um, immersed in it mm. and of course you're interacting with people all the day and finding out about science so it's pretty perfect yeah that sounds great actually mm -hmm. so do you have difficulty recruiting staff or is that um only just recently because of the pandemic but i think that's true for sort of all areas at the moment but um no we can recruit from uh straight from school so as long as the people are over 18 and we will train them up and they'll get um, Institute of Animal Technology qualifications or we can um, employ from university, they'll still go through the same training. Um, but, it, but it's nice to have a mixture of people. Yeah. So what do you think the biggest challenges are then in your job? The biggest challenges? Um, the biggest challenge was the pandemic. Mm -hmm. and, and myself and... and 
James Cruikshank, who's the operations manager at Aries, he's responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the facility. Whoa, we spoke every day, every day there were challenges. Um, we have to maintain, you know, animal care, mm -hmm. animal welfare, because you, you know, they work every day, 365 days a week. They don't get Christmas day off yeah, or yeah. Uh, weekends. You have to make sure that you've got enough staff to care properly for animals. And obviously, we wanted to care for the staff, so we had to um, make sure that they were wearing PPE all the time. We sort of separated where they were going to work to keep them in smaller groups so that they weren't mixing. And actually, we were lucky enough not to have any spread of COVID within mm -hmm. the facility. Um, and there were some other challenges as well that you wouldn't expect, like rodent diet. The rodent diets irradiated because our animal facility is ultra clean. We don't want any infections or anything in that because obviously immunologists, if you've got an infection already there, they won't get the results. So the animal house is really clean. So the diet has to be irradiated. The irradiators were in Europe and they were switched over to irradiating hospital equipment for mm. treating COVID. Um, and we couldn't get diet irradiated, so we had to get some from America. And it's all, it's all these sort of problems that you have to solve. Um, I'm proud that we managed to maintain a service to the scientists, um, look after the mice, remain compliant. And um, we only had a few of the staff get COVID, but they got them outside of work, so we got yeah. it outside of work. And the stresses and strains of your job, I guess, bring us to... The Lego, These yeah. These remarkable flowers that you brought along. Yeah, so as I said before, I can get immersed in work and I don't switch off. Mm -hmm. You know, at night you're home with your little notepad and you wake up in the middle of the night and you're like, oh, I've got to remember to do this, got to do this. Or I don't go home and my husband doesn't get fed. So in order to make a break at the end of the day, I always do half an hour of Lego and my office is full of the Lego. Every day? Every, well, yeah, every day unless I'm, it's really late and I don't have time to do it. Mm. Um, I tend to, I always do it on a Friday, I always make time on a Friday, but if I can I'll do a little bit at the end of the day just to unwind and, you know, switch off from, from work. Um, so if you're building one of the really big models, are you able to stop yourself or do you end up Staying here till nine o'clock to finish it off. Uh, well, I'm, I have done occasionally <laughs> stayed that late, but um, no, my husband usually phones me and says, um, I need my dinner. And is there, I don't know how many Lego models there are in the world. Are you anywhere near having oh, done? No, 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 thousands. <laughs> uh, the Lego are quite uh, clever. They only release a model for a certain amount of time and then you can't get it and oh. you have to buy it at twice the price on eBay. So. It's, it's apparently meant to be a better investment than gold. Really? Yeah. Oh, better start shopping. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps we should start a campaign that the LMB should write into Lego to get them to make a Lego LMB for the, for yes. the 60th birthday. Yes, that would be fantastic. They do, they'll do that, won't they? Well, well, yeah, well, they do do it. There's, um, you can send in your own designs. And if you get 10,000 votes on the website, it gets it, it can get produced. Oh, we need to do this. We totally need we to do, do that, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I've got a little scientist here with a little flask and there's a little mouse on here. So we've got the beginnings of a... Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> I'm very tempted to have a go at that, I have to say. <laughs> Leslie, thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Thank you. <laughs>